unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Now, today, I've been compelled by the Spirit of God to talk about divine favor. Of course, some people say, oh, you know, I'm favored. And then we've had people who say, oh, you know, uh, I need God's favor in something or... I don't know how to walk in the favor of God, or some actually have the honest question, what is the favor of God, you know? And what does that mean biblically? And of course, I believe that many ministers, books, CDs have taken account of this to give their mind and revelation concerning this, and of whom many of them have actually been so accurate and true concerning these things. And for such a time, I feel led by the Spirit as well to give my knowledge in this wonderful mystery, to understand what it means to walk, to attract, to deal in the favor of God. Of course, the Bible has examples. It has many things concerning the favor of God. We have many examples of people, many examples of events with which the favor of God has been invoked and they have given amazing results. Now, firstly, you'll allow me to express the fervent implications, the ardent implications, the most defining implications of favor. When we say that a man has favor, what does that do? What does the favor of God do for you? What is it able to do for you? And I'll give you a few pointers. One, favor promotes a man over another man. The glory of this favor that we receive or bestowed on us by God will promote you, will keep in the promotions of the Spirit. So when the Bible says that promotions come from neither east nor west, but they come from God, what does that mean? It means that the way God bestows promotion on a man is through the means of favor. It's the favor of God that comes on a man that separates him from the 1,000 people that have all applied for the same job, and that man is favored. But not only for the job, for those of you that are chasing contracts and businesses, it's that thing that will put you in front and ahead if you have not manipulated your way there. Because the favor of God is independent of man's effort. It just comes on a person. And so if we are to discuss the glories of promotions in the spirit, when we say promotions come from neither east nor west, but from God, from God. When you understand that promotions come from God, those of you that are working somewhere and you need to be promoted, or even in ministry we are promoted. Today you're in one space of ministry and glory, and then the next day you're in one space of ministry and glory, and things continue opening up and opening up on your life, and then they promote you to spaces where your voice is heard, louder than it has been before, and it comes with a certain authority than it has had before. We're talking about anything that defines the promotions in the spirit. Because firstly, we must see the promotions of the spirit before we see the physical manifestations of those promotions. And if we are to discuss that, then favor is the mind, favor is the spirit, favor is the element, favor is the matter, and it is the substance of those things. Number two, Favor punctuates a man to gentle and careful treatment. When you carry the favor of God in your life, people will treat you gently. People will deal with you carefully. People will treat you carefully. Not because you're a tough person. I'm not talking about those spaces where people say, you know, that woman is so tough. That man is so tough. No, 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 no. We're talking about people dealing with you gently or carefully. Because they see something that is unique and of distinct importance in your life. Punctuates you to great treatment, gentle treatment, and care. When the favor of God is on your life, everywhere you go, there will always be somebody who is willing to make things comfortable for you. 
you sit in a car, there will always be somebody who will want to make you comfortable in that car. If you fly, there will always be somebody at the airport or somewhere who will seek to make you comfortable. That's the power of God. To treat you with gentleness. And that's what the favor of God does. Because the opposite of that is you would be treated so wickedly. You would be treated so aggressively. The world is not kind. It's the world we live in, unfortunately. It's a world of many crazy people and crazy things. And anybody can harm you if you don't know how to relate with God a certain way, if you don't know how to under God, not just to wall yourself in, but to hedge yourself in spiritually. But it is the favor of God that attracts some things. The other thing is gracious kindness. It draws gracious kindness. When the favor of God is on your life, men will want to favor you with kindness. They'll be kind to you. They'll be kind to you. There are some people, they will not even need to know you for long. They will not need to know you for years. They will not need to know you for months. Some people can meet you for the first time and they love you the first time they meet you. And they feel like they want to be kind to you. That's what the favor of God does. It draws a certain kind of gracious kindness. That the kindness that is extended to you is with grace. And you need it in every aspect of life. In your family, in your ministry, in your career in your businesses, in whatever you carry yourself into, you need that kind of kindness. But also, the favor of God is a magnet of privilege. Some people take lightly or esteem lightly the power of privilege. And that is why today in our generation we don't have true understandings of honor. Because privilege is an invitation for you to participate in realms that are higher than you, in realms that are greater than you. They are the power of opportunity. And that opportunity you need to define you ahead of those who might run faster than you, who might be wiser than you, who might be well qualified than you, who might be more skillful than you, who might be stronger than you, who might be more acquainted than you are who are motivated than you are, who are certified than you are, who are instructed more than you are, the glory of privilege comes with the favor of God. Because in some of those privileges, you'll have opportunities to do certain things that certain people in a lifetime will never have the opportunity to do. And these are the things that will elevate you. These are the things that will grow you. The things in the world to bless you are available for you. God has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. But not everything that is available for us, we have access to. It's not so. And sometimes there is a confusion in the language. The accents are frustrated when we are trying to connect both the opportunities that are available for us and the way to those opportunities. Hagar would have died of thirst if the Lord had not opened her eyes to see the well that was before her. The Bible didn't say that God created a well. No, she had a lad, her son Ishmael, and they were dying in the desert. The Bible didn't say that God created a well. No, the Bible says... That God opens her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. Question, what if she had not seen that well? She would have died of thirst. And if she had died of thirst, there would have been an assumption that she died of thirst because there was no well around her. No, the well was around her. But the privilege to see it, the privilege to see it, some of your opportunities are more near than you believe. But you're so blind from those realities. There are people who are ordained for you to bless you in this life. And they are not far from you. They're perhaps connected to your closest friend. But for some random reason, that conversation has never come up and the wisdom and mind to bring this manifestation has never happened and you are walking on in a life of frustration and you're stuck with many things yet the person who can save you is next door 
The person who can save you is not far from you. The person with the keys to your next level of glory is not far from you. And that is why I tell people, it is a great blessing when by wisdom you can tell the things and the people that should promote you. Because when you do, life will be so easy for you. When you do, you'll design the ways of God more deeply and intimately than you have ever been before. The Bible says it's not far from them. Though he be not far. God is not far. The things that should bless us are not far. The opportunities of the Spirit are not far. They are not far. They are near. They are near. It's the glory of favor to extend a privilege for you to connect to those things. So you don't take lightly the favor of God. The other thing about the favor of God is the thing that preserves you above all that hate you and have set themselves against you. Because it's one thing to be hated, persecuted, abused, attacked. And then those that attack you have a hand higher than you. Have an advantage bigger than you. Extend authority over your domain and frustrate your realms of function. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 41, the 11th verse, if you read from the Amplified Version, it says, by this I know that you have favor and delight in me because my enemy does not triumph over me. Shout hallelujah. And so it means that when you are dealing with enemies, God has let certain things happen for a certain reason. People will frustrate you. In this world, you'll have people who hate you without cause. You know? And somebody says, oh, you know, they say you do this, you teach that, you act this way. And you ask this person, but have you ever listened to me preach? Oh, no, I have actually never, but I think I have an issue about you. But, but have you ever actually heard me preach? Oh, no, I have never. So by what right do you have to judge me? Yeah, it's possible. And it can go a bit further, and then people will attack you in your workplaces. People will attack you in the ministry. People will attack you in your career. People will attack you in whatever they will. But the Bible says that when the favor of God is on your life, the Bible says he will cause your enemy to stay under you. And that's how you know that you're favored of God. I have looked at my life since the day I was born because I was sealed with instruction from my mother's womb when she was pregnant of me. The Lord spoke to her about me as a minister. So she knew that this guy she was giving birth to was a man of God. However, I looked at my life from the day I was born till now and I've never seen any man that has ever set themselves against me and they are over me. I've never seen it. There's no man that has ever set themselves against me and they are over me. And that's the favor of God. That's the favor of God. When it settles on your life, nothing that could destroy you can come. Or whatever comes to you is not able to withstand the power and the glory of God upon your life. The influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things will shake you and take you to its end. You'll be attacked. And that's why sometimes I emphasize with our preachers. That sometimes when we are speaking of the finer things of master, we must emphasize that when we're talking about the favor of God, we have to preach it balanced. Why? Because only the favored are persecuted. Only the favored, I repeat, are persecuted. So you don't think that because you're in a mix of persecution, therefore you are not loved or less loved than the one who is enjoying the peace of that point and hour. No. Sometimes, or many a time, it's the favor of God on your life that attracts people to have issues with you, jealousies and envies. And that never stops. Why? Because Satan does not know how to deal with a favored woman. Satan does not know how to react to a favored man. Why? Because he sees the hand of God extending this man or woman for promotion and there is nothing in the world he can do. So what does he do? He'll seek to disqualify this individual. So if you don't understand the ways of the Spirit, you could draw back easily to perdition. Yet the Bible says that we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but we are of them that believe to the serving of the soul. So we look at the patriarchs, our fathers of the faith. Joseph, the Bible is clear, his father favored this young man. He found favor before his father. And what happens? His brothers turn against him. <laughs> they attack him. You know, they throw him in a ditch and leave him there for transaction. But it wasn't because that he had a spirit of rejection on his life. In fact, if Joseph lived in 2020, people would be casting a spirit of rejection off his life. (laughs) 
No, no, no. Joseph was not rejected. He was a man which was favored. And the things that were working in men, his brothers, he did not know how to respond to the glory and favor that had fallen on this young man. And it's possible because this is the deception of the spirit of jealousy. It deceives a man into thinking that because one has increased, therefore you have decreased. That's the deception of jealousy. It deceives you that because you've seen one get more elevation or promotion or increase, therefore you, the individual which observes them, you have gone down or reduced. And that's the deception of the enemy. But also, the Bible speaks of how even when Joseph had started having dreams, the Bible says that even his father at one point was annoyed. Why? Because he was hearing a story of an elevation that did not quite suit the natural order of pattern and tradition as they had no need from the fathers. How can the sun and the moon and the stars pay obeisance to this guy, worship him and fall before him? How does that work? It disturbed the father. But it is true because that's what the favor of God does. Even when you're least qualified, it places you in the most unlikely promotions. How is she reached this way when we have worked for these years and we've not gotten this money? How is this ministry, this success, when we have served God for 40 years, 60 years, and we've not seen it? How is that? And if they cannot respond to the interpretation of this, then they will turn themselves against it. So if you are a person who really believes in the favor of God or understands what the favor of God does, then you get ready. These things will come to you. But the Bible says that even though he's in the pit, even though he's bought, even though he goes into Potiphar's house, he goes as a slave, one which was a son of a loved man, but he's still under the favor of God. In Genesis 39, verses 6, the Bible says, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Who was that? Potiphar. When he gets him into his house, he leaves all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had done, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph, the Bible says, was a goodly person and well favored. The Bible tells us the wife of Potiphar accuses the fellow, he's thrown into prison. Verses 21 of the same 39th chapter, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did, there he was the doer of it. It just used to continue introducing this man in elevation, even in the worst spaces that he was thrown by those that hated him. And where did the man end up? He ended up as the governor of a nation. Get note of that blood. That's what the favor of God does. The Bible speaks of Samuel. In 1 Samuel, the second chapter, the 26th verse, the Bible says, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. The Bible speaks of Esther, the second chapter, the 17th verse. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins, so that he set a royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. The Bible speaks of Job. It's Job testifying in the 10th chapter, the 12th verse. It says, Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation has preserved my spirit. In Daniel, the first chapter, the ninth verse, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. We go into the New Testament. In Luke chapter 128, the angel came into her, Mary, and said, Hail that thou a highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And that's the glory that allows her to carry the life of the Son of God as we know it. We get into Jesus Christ's story in Luke, the second chapter, the 52nd verse. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Every man that has connected with God needs this thing. I could continue emphasizing the favor of God. If Jesus, the Son of God, needed it, if the Bible says that he had to increase in it, it means favor can be increased. Hallelujah, glory to God. It means favor can be increased. It's not static. And we're all functioning in different realms of favor as it has been increased on our lives. And so it is possible for the favor of God to increase on your life. It is very possible. And I want to show you how to increase in favor. I want to show you how to walk in the favor of God, to activate the favor of God, to attract the favor of God, to function in the favor of God. Because this is the difference of the covenants. 
It's a difference of a covenant. And of course, it's not so directly interpreted or understood by those who teach it sometimes or who read it sometimes because of the interesting nuances, if I may call them, the slight shades that look, seem like they're slight, but they are so deep interpretation that if you understand these things, your prayer life will change, your ministry life will change, the way you deal in life will change, and you'll start to see more things come to you than you go to. You'll start to see you reap more than you have sown. You'll start to see harvests bigger than you can count. You'll start to see elevations that are higher than you could articulate. And that's the favor of the Spirit. And as it continues, if you learn not just to walk, but to increase in it, because it's available for you. So when the Bible says grow in knowledge, that means that God hasn't put epignosis in us. But we grow in connecting to what's progressively known with our minds to connect to what is anciently defined in our spirits. Hallelujah, glory to God. So, I'll read a few things, about three things, that I think are very important, very, very defining for people to understand. There are about three uh, pillars that might seem simple as I share them, but as I go deep, you'll understand what they really mean. The Bible says in Proverbs, the 11th chapter, the 27th verse, if you read from the Amplified Version, the Bible says that he who diligently seeks good, seeks God's favor. Proverbs 11, 27, the Amplified Version. He who diligently seeks good, seeks God's favor. But he who searches after evil, it shall come to you. Now, this wise man is talking about men which have learned to diligently seek good. To diligently seek good. What does it mean to diligently seek good? Now, I would say that if you're a good person, if you learn to do good, or if you invest your energies in doing good to people and being good to the world, you'll increase in the favor of God. And that's true. But in the New Testament, that's an incomplete statement. Because in the New Testament dispensation, goodness is not a deliberate act. Goodness is a fruit of the Spirit. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Galatians, the 5th chapter 22nd, Verse, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. You see, underline the word goodness there. So here is where we miss the completion of this narrative. We speak of how men ought to seek diligently goodness that they might connect and increase in the favor that is available for them already in God. But then, sometimes when we are preaching it, we preach it from a legal perspective, from a performance-driven perspective. And because of that, they start to apply their efforts to do good so as to earn or connect to the wisdom of God. That is not how we teach in the New Testament. In the New Testament... We have to take the man to the space and the corner where that man understands that he's begotten firstly of the word of God, the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. In 1 Peter 1.23, he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's out of the incorruptibleness of the seed in which we have been begotten by the nature with which we have in Christ Jesus. Are you following me? That we are positioned, that we are set and pissed, we are steadied into the direction of allowing the seed, which is of the word of God, to grow through and become a living plant where we it shall bring forth the fruit. And it's out of the fruit of that seed of the word of God that goodness comes. So we're not saying be a good person. We're saying that of the new birth, connect to the word of God that aligns your spirit to the fruit of goodness. And when the fruit of goodness is working in you, you will realize that favor is not something you seek. Favor is something that follows you because you received the seed. 
The engrafted word of God, which is in your spirit, it's able to save you and give you an inheritance. So, when we're talking about the new birth, I'm not saying be a good person. That's a command. That's as the law. I am saying connect to the goodness which is in you, which is in Christ, by the seed which is incorruptible. Because see, when that seed is incorruptible, how can it set itself to become bad when originally it's incorruptible? It's incorruptible. You are born of an incorruptible seed. So you connect to that incorruptibleness of that seed and allow that that seed, when planted in the right ground in your heart, it will sprout out forth as the word of God continues to come through the true word of God. The pure word of the spirit continues to come in your spirit. You realize that it will create the fruit of goodness as a result of the ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit on your life as he operates on you and in you. And that is why when a man sits under the right teaching, you don't tell him to become good. You just find that over the years you become a good person. And as that goodness continues to propel and work in your life, consequently, you start to see that more favor is coming toward you. More favor is increasing. Favor is multiplying on your life. Yet not as though you deliberately woke up to become good, but that you yielded to the seed, which is the word of God that is incorruptible. And because it's incorruptible, the Bible is very clear that a bad tree cannot produce a good fruit. And a good tree cannot produce a bad fruit. You see, it cannot bring corruption if it's not corrupted. And neither can corrupted things bring incorrupt things. You see? So, sometimes it takes us back to the foundation of the nature with which we have in Christ Jesus. Who are you? Were you taught that you are this bad person that is trying to be good, yet you're a new creation? No, if you're not born again, it's agreeable that you're bad. Not actually because you're a bad, bad person, but actually because you have refused to receive this seed, which is the word of God, in your heart through faith. Because the word becomes flesh and dwells among men. And the Bible says, and we behold his only glory as a true son of God, full of grace and truth. So, when you become born again, here's the trick. You find born again Christians who are still struggling to walk in the favor of God. It's because they have not yet understood what they have begotten of. And because they have not yet understood what they have begotten of, to them, goodness is a seed, not a fruit. Yet in the New Testament, goodness is supposed to be a fruit of the new birth, not a seed. It's a result. It's a consequence. It's an aftermath. It's not the seed thereof. What is the seed thereof? The seed thereof is the nature with which we have in Christ Jesus when we believe on the Lordship of Jesus Christ and submit our lives entirely to him. If you understand this, then you are on the way of not only walking in the favor of God that is upon your life, but increasing in the same. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So you see again, this goodness does not begin with you. It does not begin as a seed. No, it's a fruit of the new birth. And so for those who have not understood the fruit of the new birth, they are inclining more all their lives trying to connect to the seed of goodness. And if you do that, you're breaking the order of the spirit because you crucify Christ again. Hallelujah. The second pillar Again, if I'm talking about the walking in favor, the book of Psalms, the fifth chapter, the twelfth verse says, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, will thou compass him, the Bible says, as with a shield. As with a shield. So, let's see it this way. When the psalmist understands God and how God functions, he sees that when a man is righteous before God, when a man is moving in the righteousness of God, the Bible says that that man will be encompassed with favor as a shield, as a protection. They are protected by the favor of God. Even if you have issues with them, there are people above you who have a say in that issue that you have and can acquit them of your accusation, of your judgment, of your attack. You see, that's what it means to be shielded. But he has said that the righteous are encompassed with a shield of favor. So, he means that if a man understands the righteousness of God, then he understands the favor of God. He'll increase and grow in the favor of God. In Proverbs, the 14th chapter, the 9th verse, 
The Bible says, fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous, there is a favor, or there is favor among the righteous. So we see that for me to walk in the favor of God, I need to walk in the righteousness of God. And what do the people of the old covenant or people who have not yet understood the new dispensation teach? They will say, therefore, live a righteous life so you will obtain favor before God. And that's false teaching. Because we don't leave it first to obtain it. No, we learn firstly that in the New Testament, righteousness is not a work earned. We're not saying that in the New Testament we are against right living or righteous living. No. On the contrary, actually, the New Testament teaches us how to walk or live in righteousness than the old could ever teach us. And so if I'm teaching the grace message, I expect that because of grace, I should actually live right more than the man or the woman that has not understood the power of grace. But here is the catch in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we don't talk about righteousness as a work. We talk about righteousness as a gift of God that is imputed unto us because of faith. The Bible says, For if by one man's offense or sin, death entered and reigned by one, and it says, Much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift, the Bible calls it, of righteousness, shall reign in this one life by this Jesus Christ. So, in the New Testament, righteousness is a gift that a man receives. And when that man receives that gift of righteousness, then that man learns to walk in the gift that they have received. In the New Testament, we only walk in what we have received freely. Because the person of the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of the things which are freely given unto us by Christ. So yes, the Bible has told us that the righteous are encompassed as a shield with favor. The Bible has told us that among the righteous is favor. But in the New Testament, the Bible says, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not sin, but imputeth righteousness by faith. The Bible says, and now the righteousness of God without the law has been revealed. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith or the faith of Jesus Christ. And to all and upon all who believe, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible says, but they have been justified or made righteous freely through the redemption which is in Christ. Hallelujah, glory to God. And so because they have that justification which is free, grace bestowed upon them through the redemption which is in Christ, the New Testament believer does not seek righteousness. He is a receiver of righteousness. And because he is a receiver of righteousness... It comes on you not because of your works, but because of your faith toward God. And when you have believed that it is on you, then the works of righteousness start working in you as one which has received the free gift of righteousness. And that is why the Bible asks, cometh this blessedness on the circumcised or the uncircumcised? Then it gives an example of our father Abraham in Romans chapter 4. He says, did he obtain righteousness before circumcision? Or after circumcision. For if it was after circumcision, the Bible says he has wherewith to glory, but not before God. But the Bible says, nay, he received righteousness before circumcision. And the Bible says, and he received circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, Romans 4.11. And the Bible says that he might become the father of all men, of all that believe, though they be not yet circumcised. But the Bible says, but because they are believers in that mystery, in that understanding, in that circumcision, the Bible says they might receive the righteousness of God imputed unto them also. Glory to God. So God does not wait for you to do good things, to live a righteous life, to bestow and increase favor on your life. No, he waits for you to believe and receive the righteousness which you have in Christ Jesus. And when you believe and receive the righteousness which is in Christ Jesus, even yet before your transformation, yes, he is working on your transformation because the end of that gift is for you to live a righteous life. But while you're still living it, that does not disqualify you from the favor that is available to the righteous because you're not righteous by works. You're righteous through faith. Wow! Glory to God. So, when we teach the New Testament and we emphasize righteousness imputed by faith, it is because we want to position you in a favor that is without excuse. Because this one requires you only to believe. 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 
Do you believe it? So when you believe it in your spirit, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it means that you're stirring all the pillars of favor to amount and align themselves for your good. When you say that I stand and walk in the righteousness of God that I've received through faith, and because of that, I will not fail in this job. And because of that, I will not fail in this marriage. And because of that, I will not fail in this career. And because of that, I will not fail in this ministry. When you appropriate the realities of what is available for you in Christ, as the Spirit of God ministers this revelation to your spirit, you will be shocked and amazed just how much favor will start to encompass you. So you see again, it's not just complete to say that among the righteous is favor or that God bestows and shields, encompasses a man with favor, which is righteous. It's complete to say, but the righteousness with which you have in Christ Jesus, New Testament dispensation, is not based on your works. It's based entirely on the faith that you have in Christ Jesus. Because your own human righteousness, which is besides the righteousness of God, the Bible calls it filthy rags. Filthy rags. And because it's filthy rags, it cannot take you anywhere. It cannot increase you. It cannot increase you. In Ecclesiastes, he speaks of sad paradox where wicked men learn to prolong their days and the righteous men die early. They're famished. They're distorted and destroyed because they do not know how to deal with the righteousness with which they have in Christ. In Ecclesiastes 7.15, it says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. He's saying, when you receive righteousness as a gift, learn how to work without gift. Because if you don't understand and receive it as a gift and know how to appropriate that gift, it doesn't matter how holy you are, you'll be disadvantaged. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. These things I'm speaking seem so simple, but they are so deep. These are the things that draw the lines and difference between the successful in the life of Christianity and those that are grassing and gnashing every day, that are failing, defeat after defeat. That's the difference. It's one thing to know it with your mind. It's another to apprehend it with your heart. The third pillar, wisdom and understanding. And I'll read for you two verses. The first verse is in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, the 35th verse. It says, the king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. So that means the kingly anointing is attracted to the power and the spirit of wisdom. Hallelujah. But in Proverbs 13, verses 15, if you will read the Amplified Version, the Bible says, good understanding wins favor. Good understanding wins favor. And that is why I emphasize the glory of wisdom and understanding. Because earlier he has said that the king favors wise men. All right? The wise servant is favored by the king. And in here he has said that good understanding wins favor. So, the marriage of the wisdom and the understanding of God, those things establish a man both in favor and increase the favor on that man's life. You don't underestimate the power of wisdom and understanding. But what does he say in Colossians, the second chapter? The third verse. The Bible speaks of God or Christ as one in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Again, it's not your work. It's you learning to lean and yield in that understanding. Because if you don't, like the Bible has said in Proverbs 13, the 15th verse, it says the way of the transgressor is hard. The Amplified calls it that way a barren, dry soil or the impassable swamp. Your life starts to look barren and dry. But the opposite of that is that when you learn how to walk in the wisdom and revelation, the understanding of the Spirit of God, it means that you'll increase, you will grow, you will be established in the favor of God. But he has said that in whom? You, in Christ. He becomes our wisdom. He carries all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says in Corinthians, he has become unto us wisdom, redemption, sanctification, so you learn to fellowship with the person of Jesus Christ. 
to understand his way, his ministry, his heart, his vision, his perception concerning, you know, the life and the things of the Spirit. When you connect to the wisdom and understanding of God, he says you will increase in favor. This is the way that is not known by many people because they think that you just need a man of God to say, favor, you understand? But the guy who bestows it on you also, he does it only by the degree and realm of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge in which he functions. Now you have Christ. And the Bible says in him is the fullness of God bodily. He is the fullness of God bodily. So anything you could ever want in God is complete in Christ bodily. And the Bible says that he's the heir. He's the rule of all principality and power. He's above all these things. So when we teach wisdom, when we teach revelation, again in the New Testament, knowledge, we don't teach it as something that a man should apply themselves to the effort of, but as something that a man should lean into as something that is already applicable and available for them because it is given to them to know the mysteries of God, to connect to the wisdom and understanding of the Spirit. And it is available to them, in them, through the person of Jesus Christ. And so there is the portal open for the man to say, how then do I connect to the wisdom and understanding that should propel me to the favor that I need, both for that function of the hour and that which I have to increase into? Simple. Understand Jesus. Understand the person of Christ. Understand what God has done through the person of Jesus Christ. And that is why I invite people that the Christian life should be a life of contemplative meditation. It should be a life of contemplative meditation. What do I mean by that? Contemplative meditation is the invitation that you have by the grace of God to be able to see Things in the spirit, not many people are able to see in the word of God. Today, when we're talking about the demystification of the mysterious, some people only end in picking phone numbers and number plates. No, go deeper. It's not wrong to pick them, but go deeper into the demystification of the mystery Christ. The man prays and says, open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things in your word. What does that mean? Because it is possible to read the word with a closed eye. It's possible to read the word of God, but without the right precision of vision. The blindness of the spirit is a very bad thing. Because it will make a man pass over the thing that should deliver them into their next space of destiny. It causes a man to overlook and not realize the thing that is available for their next promotion story, for their next glory and function in God. I wish I could emphasize how important this is. I wish I could emphasize how important this is. The liberties of the Spirit that are available for us for access are way more in this time than they have ever been in human history. But now sometimes even the pain of our dispensation is not so much as up to the scarcity of the word, as it is as to the so available it is to men that they esteem lightly the things that are so great and grand far to see because many of them have not been taught to relate with the word of God as an experience. For them it's not an experience. And there's some that is a beauty. And that is why one of the greatest gifts God can ever give you is to become a lover of the word. Just to fall in love with the word. There are people who love the word. They can listen to a good teacher teach for hours and they don't want to move. Why? Because they've fallen in love. That means their eyes are connecting. Self has been washed off their eyes and now they see God in the true vision as they have to see him. The purity of spirit. Blessed are the pure. The Bible says in heart, for they shall see the Lord. And that purity sometimes connects or comes to us as the clarity of the word through truth is given us. If you don't do it this way, you will go on prayer mountains to look for favor. If you do not do it this way, you will fast a hundred years to get favor. If you don't do it this way, you will toil, you will waste, you will do whatever you have to do in the flesh, and you'll only 
go on downward and downward spiral of your life. And the people, when you look at them walking the life of salvation after 10, 15 years, they look more pathetic than they first believed. Because the Bible says they have ignored the way of the Spirit. The wombs are dry. They don't know their way around this. And this is the truth. When the day I understood this, I have increased in favor every day of my life. All the opportunities, the ministries that have opened, the television stations that have called us to air out our services. God is good. And that is called the favor of God. When it comes on your life, even if you hide yourself in a mountain or a valley or a desert or a forest, I always tell people, men will dig roads to find you there. That's what the favor of God does. It brightens your star. That even the farthest people will follow it. So we thank God. We thank God. I want you to lift your voice and speak in other tongues and connect to what is already yours. Star yourself for its increase. And you're going to be amazed what's going to do for you. Just lift your voice right now and start to speak in other tongues. Somebody raise your voice and speak in other tongues. Shere brozolo boko talabaya la bako sata. Janda bo broze ke telepaya bako shalaba baba baba. Keri brozanda raba jo broko talaba baba baba. Jori braza katara baba baba ko shatala boro bobo bobo. Come on, pray, pray, pray. Zapa tele brozo boko sha. Kobra katele brozi leba. The favor of God is here. The favor of God is with you. The favor of God is in your house. The favor of God is in your business. The favor of God is in your ministry. The favor of God is in your marriage. The favor of God is among your children. Somebody open your voice and just speak. Ripatala brakatala bozobo koshatala. Misheri rebo kotara baba baba kata. Shaya bakatala bakatala po prozo poko telepa. Riba zala mandoro prozi po telepa ya kata. Shanderi prozi po si katala pa. Rima za proze leke tila banda. Hosata la prozo boko. Connect to it. Jesus has become your wisdom. He has become your knowledge. In him are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The righteousness of God is imputed upon you through faith. The goodness of God on your life is a fruit and not a seed. Just lean in. God is saying lean in. It's available for you. Just receive it. It's available for you. Just connect it. I want you to take just a minute and speak in your next month. Speak into your next two years. Speak into your next three years. Speak into your next four years. Speak into your next five years. Speak into your next six years. Speak into your next 30 years. Speak into your next 50 years. Speak into your next eight years. Speak the favor of God on your ministry. Speak the favor of God on whatever you do. Speak the favor of God on your voice. Speak the favor of God on your frequency in the spirit. Speak the favor of God on your print. Speak the favor of God on your copies. Speak the favor of God on your continents. Speak the favor of God on your identity. Speak the favor of God on your body, in your mind, in your health. Speak the favor of God on your children from the first to the last. Speak the favor of God on your spouse. Speak the favor of God on your nation. Speak the favor of God on your continent. Speak the favor of God on your extended family. Speak the favor of God in the world. Speak the favor of God on the platforms that are available for you to preach the gospel, to extend your gifting, to turn your craft. Speak the favor of God on everything you do. Speak the favor of God on the vision of God concerning your life. Speak the favor of God on your hearing. Speak the favor of God on your heart of meditation. Speak the favor of God on your seeking. Speak the favor of God on your prayer. Speak the favor of God on your interpretation. Speak the favor of God on your translation. I speak the favor of God on everything that concerns your life. On everything that concerns your ministry. On everything that concerns your family. This is a great year for you. This is a great year for you. Yes, there is a casting down, but for you is a lifting up. We have increased this year as a ministry. 
than we have ever before. The devil is a liar. The enemy will not triumph over you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the anointing. Receive the glory that changes things. Receive the power that changes circumstances. Receive the glory that upholds things. Receive the glory that changes economies. Receive the glory that changes families. Receive the glory that changes houses. Receive the glory that changes ministries. Receive the glory that changes businesses. Receive the glory that changes organizations. Receive the favor that changes things. Receive the favor that elevates. Receive the favor that promotes. Receive the favor that shields. Receive the favor that under guards. Receive the favor that protects. Receive the favor that upholds. Receive the favor that sustains. Receive the favor that preserves in the mighty name of Jesus. Shata brakata. Come on, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Say, Father, I receive it. That glory is mine. That glory is mine. Just receive it. Tell him, God, that favor is mine. Kindness is mine. Gentle treatment is mine care is mine the world will handle me more generously privilege is open to me opportunities are for me they're for this hour and nothing for me will bypass me and all who turn themselves against you they will not triumph I say they will not triumph I say they will not triumph in the mighty name of Jesus hallelujah Glory to God. Glory to God. If you're sick in your body, in the mighty name of Jesus, I release the anointing that heals. Receive your healing. God is healing you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because it's done. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you're not born again, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. enter this favor and grace where we stand. But more than that, that he shed his blood for you that you might live and not die. So I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And to do that, you repeat these words after me. You say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. And today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.